All right, so welcome everyone to today's class or sermon rather on negotiation. Uh, this is certainly not a topic that I have formally studied. What I'm gonna share with you today is my own experiences with negotiation as both someone at a publishing house, uh, someone who's run numerous publications, someone who's seen lots of different types of contracts over the years, um, good contracts, bad contracts, everything in between. Um, and I, I'm hoping to share with you um, some specific questions and tools you can use if you're faced with a contract that you would like to negotiate. But I would like to add a really big caveat up front. If you have a book publishing contract in front of you, I strongly suggest that you get a literary lawyer or an agent to help you negotiate that contract. It's not that you can't do it by yourself, but if it's the first contract you've ever seen, I don't suggest trying to do it by yourself. We'll talk a little bit more about book contracts towards the second half of today's discussion. Uh, first, I'm gonna focus on negotiating tactics uh, specifically. And you know, I negotiated book contracts at a mid-sized publisher in Cincinnati for, oh gosh, um, how many years was it? Uh, it feels like it was a long time. I guess it was seven or eight years that I was negotiating book contracts. I also negotiated magazine contracts. Uh, often it was with agents. Sometimes it was directly with authors. And so it, I, it, opened, it opened my eyes to the very wide range of negotiating skills out there. Uh, the different styles and approaches. Some people were like attack dogs. Uh, other people didn't ask for changes at all, uh, even though they really should have asked for changes. But what you need to know when you're presented with a contract, especially in a publishing context by an editor uh, or by a publishing house, they expect you to negotiate it. They don't expect you to just accept the boilerplate. And almost everyone gets a boilerplate. Uh, agents are an exception. I'm not speaking to agents right now. I'm only speaking directly to writers and authors. So keep in mind that you are expected to ask for changes. And it, broadly speaking, everything is negotiable. Now, that doesn't mean you get everything you ask for. It doesn't mean that you can expect millions of dollars for a project with low demand in the market, at least as uh, seen by the publisher in their eyes. But contracts are there to be discussed, and you should feel comfortable asking and making changes in those contracts. There is a lot of worry among writers and authors that if they're offered a book deal or some sort of contract, that if you are, say, uh, confident enough or aggressive enough to, to ask for more money or to ask for changes or to ask for such and such rights, that somehow the editor and publisher will be offended and they will just walk away and they will never speak to you again. That doesn't happen. Um, and if it does happen in the strange, weird likelihood that that does happen, that tells you something really important about the publisher or uh, outlet that you're dealing with, namely that they're not very professional and they don't understand how contracts work. So they have just saved you let's hope, a lot of grief and suffering uh, by walking away. No one should be offended because you asked to negotiate a contract or an agreement or a deal. Now, I'm really specifically talking about contracts, agreements, uh, things where you are presented with something that you and some other entity signs. I am not talking, however, about terms of service. And I make that clarification because a lot of authors enter into terms of service with big, big companies like Amazon KDP or Ingram Spark or draft to digital or you know really huge companies where it's a take it or leave it proposition. And as an individual among maybe millions of people, no, you cannot negotiate a terms of service. I am talking about contracts, it's contracts that you are offered by a very specific company that you have to sign. So I wanna make that different, I want to point out that difference right away, just so there's no confusion. So again, it's really important to understand a book deal is almost never a take it or leave it proposition. And for those that are, uh, that again, that says something really particular about who's making that offer 
and the sort of relationship that you might be entering into and how desirable that relationship might be for you. Doesn't mean you should take it or leave it either one, but you, you, you've just had some really important information there if that's the way it's presented to you. As I said, though, in every negotiation, uh, the parties bring different amounts of leverage or history. Sometimes there's a prior relationship. Um, there are lots of factors that affect, affect a negotiation. And I think the best approach in many cases is to be reasonable, to present your case, to talk about what you want, about what you value, what your priorities are, where you've got wiggle room, where you're willing to compromise, um, and not be mean about it. Uh, I have to say, as an editor, I always kind of resented the agents who were really mean. And it was, I learned over time that it wasn't personal. Uh, in fact, that was just, they were attack dogs. That was their stance, was to come out really mean and aggressive. And then once you were like taken aback and maybe, you know, apologized, like once they had you um, on the back foot, that's when they would kind of ease off. And once they got what they wanted, they would be all uh, sweetness and light. So there are those styles out there, but I think usually for authors and writers, if you're the one negotiating, uh, it's, I don't know that the attack dog stance particularly benefits you. Uh, that's personal opinion, but I think you want to look like someone who is coming to the table to negotiate in good faith um, rather than using anger or resentment or offense as your first emotional strategy. Now, I just mentioned leverage. That is pretty important in any negotiation, especially understanding, if you can, what sort of leverage you have. Sometimes authors feel like they have no leverage whatsoever that their work has no value, that they have been begging for someone to give them a contract for years and years and years. Now, finally, they have one, and so they ask for nothing. You know, They don't want to torpedo the deal uh, by looking ungrateful in some way. Uh, this often happens with people early in their careers when they're negotiating salaries. Maybe you feel so grateful to have this job that there's no way you're going to ask for a better salary or try to negotiate other terms. You're just so happy to finally have someone who wants you. You're like, yes, whatever you tell me to sign, I'll sign it. Um, and I've certainly done that in my career, my very first salary job. I, you know, to the depths of my very depths, I was just like so grateful to have a publishing job. It wouldn't have occurred to me to ask for more. And that first salary was $18,000 a year. <laughs> it's like uh, pretty crazy uh, thinking back about how little it was, although granted uh, we're talking about 25 years ago almost. Um, and then when I got my first book contract, um, this was with the University of Chicago Press, you know, I didn't negotiate the advance. Uh, now there's some reasons for that. I mean, I could have, I could have pushed for more, but frankly, I didn't care. Um, but it all, the part of it is also psychological. I just didn't feel like, ugh, I don't, I don't want to go through that. I don't, I, I'm not actually, you know, a born negotiator. I'm not, I'm not someone who really wants to be pushing for all these things. Although there were pieces of that contract that I did change. Anyway, we'll talk about book contracts a little later. So back to the main point, leverage. It helps to know if you have any. If you're being offered a contract in the first place, it means the publisher or the editor, whomever, has something you're interested in and they think is worth contracting for, like having rights to. So go in with confidence, with, with even fake it if you have to. Um, you're allowed to protect your interests at the very least, even if you think your work doesn't have as much monetary value as someone else's, even if you feel like you're emerging or early career, even if you're grateful, you want to protect your interests. That's very natural and you, you ought to, and the publisher expects you to. Now that in mind, if you're making the approach to the publisher, if you've been out holding out your hat and begging, and you know, I don't wanna say begging, but it may feel like you're begging, um, you probably have less leverage. If you've been approached proactively, then I would say you want to play it cool and ask for more. Um, in both cases, in fact, ask for more. But if you're being approached, you generally get to ask for a lot more maybe than the initial offer. 
when it comes to any negotiation, it helps to know what's important to the other party, uh, to understand um, the sorts of projects they sign, the sort of content or books that they're interested in, how well you fit into you know what they do if you, you know so so that you can understand how desirable you might be to this other party so d do your research um, ask other people who've worked with this publisher or company and you can ask them directly what's important to them uh, usually the editors or whomever you're dealing with the contract managers they'll usually be pretty direct about what is negotiable or not negotiable about their contracts you know they don't they don't want to be butting heads with you. They want everyone to have a, usually, usually they want everyone to have a clear understanding of why the contract says what it does and how it's going to facilitate a good working relationship. Some questions you can ask when you're presented with a contract. Um, you can ask, is this a typical agreement? Uh, if you're not sure, like some publishers have different types of contracts that they offer. You might be sent a boilerplate. Uh, you might be sent to work for hire in some rare cases. You might be sent something that's just for first time authors. You might be sent something that's typically given to agents. So you should never assume that what you have is the agreement that everyone else is getting. But you can ask. You can ask about, are, are these the only sorts of arrangements you do? Do you have any alternatives if what you're seeing is maybe strange to you or not appealing? Um, you can ask what typically happens during a negotiation. Um, you know, how long does it take to negotiate these contracts? Do you typic are you typically changing a lot of things? Now, the person on that other end of that question may be somewhat coy, but again, usually people are pretty open when they're asked directly about this. Um, when authors who are negotiating contracts with me at a publishing house, if they ask these sorts of questions, um, I was usually very direct about, you know, the sorts of changes that would get made and, um, how likely they were to be approved. And I would express my own limitations. Like I can only negotiate these sections. If you want to negotiate section X, uh, I have to get you know, the president's approval. So usually, like I said, people will be forthcoming because they want, they want to make this process go as smoothly as possible. Um, so don't be afraid to ask not just about what the contract means if you're not sure and you don't have a way of finding out, but ask about, you know, kind of the, the rules of engagement, if you will, and, and what's, what's normal. And hopefully the person you're working with will be transparent about it. If you aren't negotiating with someone or some company that is transparent, there are lots of ways to get some helpful information so you understand the quality of the contract you're dealing with, how good or bad or standard it is. I think this is just really empowering information to have going into any negotiation. So, you know, this applies to magazines, books, any intellectual property that you might be signing an agreement for. Look to the Authors Guild, look to major author organizations like the SFWA, the RWA, the MWA. So those are all the major genres, science fiction, romance, mystery. Uh, for journalists and freelancers, look at the American Society uh, of Journalists and Authors. Look at the Independent Book Publishers Association if you're a self-publishing author. Uh, there's Study Hall, which has a lot of uh, tip trading and discussion among freelancers about what contracts look like at particular outlets, what people are agreeing to, what's unusual, what sort of rights are unusual to be asked for, these sorts of things. So, you know, the longer you're in the industry, Fortunately, the more you understand what a normal or standard agreement looks like for your type of work. Uh, but if you're very new and it's your first contract or you know, if you're, you're entering into a new sector, you may just not know if what you're signing is taking advantage of you or if it's like what the other guy received. So like I said, having that information can be really critical to moving through the negotiation. Something else you want to ask is whoever you're negotiating with, you know, if there's money involved, there is likely a business model involved. Um, you want to think about if there's a profit and loss statement, uh, like every book out there uh, at a big publishing house likely has uh, an affiliated profit and loss that's crunching the numbers and it has all of the numbers in there about your advance and your royalties and that affects, you know, uh, that, that that's part of your contract. It affects the sort of offer you're made. 
uh, or offered the offer you're offered the offer you uh, you receive rather um, you know as the terms of the contract change that affects the profit and loss statement so again knowledge is power uh, understanding how that company's PL works will help you understand why certain things in the contract may be more challenging to adjust um, knowing how that company makes money from your intellectual property is going to help you negotiate things better. So when it comes to the money specifically, in terms of a book, this would be the advance and the royalty rates with magazines. This would be you know, your, the flat fee or the per word rate. No one's gonna offer you more money unless you ask for it. End of story. So if it, it's just, it's just nobody, nobody ever says here, have an extra thousand because you did not ask for it. Like if that does happen to you, wow, you should write a story about it and you should um, let everyone else know there's someone handing out money for free uh, without having to ask. So I think where the awkwardness comes into play, especially if you're an author negotiating is you don't know how much more to ask for, or you don't know if, you, if you're looking um, entitled or, you know, there are just all these issues that come into play. Um, so one of the questions that's easy to ask, I think, it, it, there's no risk of you looking bad, is can you do better? Is there any room here to do better? Is, is there room in that figure? Is there flexibility there? Can we negotiate that? Um, or you can say, would you consider X instead? Uh, or you could say, well, given everything this contract wants me to do, like you want me to, to deliver a full manuscript in three months, that's really fast and you're not paying me enough for that. Um, or you want me to do all of this research and you want me to handle the index and you want me to take care of permissions, that advance just isn't going to cover that for me. If, if you want me to cover all those expenses, then I need to have, I need to have at least X money. So it, you don't always have to give a reason for asking for more money, um, but it certainly helps uh, to say, well, look at what you're asking me to do. Look at the expenses you're asking me to cover. Look at the time involved. Look at the pressure uh, or look at the quality I'm delivering. Look at my platform. You should give me more. Uh, and then there are some people who are just very direct and say, look, I'm big enough or I'm important enough or whatever the case might be. I don't work for less than X. And you can say those things. And maybe you make X a little bit higher uh, than what you actually expect they will pay you. So people do tend to, you know, state numbers that are much bigger than what they're willing to settle for. But that's, you know, that's part of the negotiation. So there are some contracts or some negotiations where it, it might be a surprise or maybe it's expected you're asked to break your own business model. So, you know, maybe you're asked to speak for free and that's just something you don't do because that's where you make most of your money or you're asked to write for free and you don't do that because that's where you make your money. Um, so you say, you can have, you can have responses to that. Like I, uh, when I first agreed to be a columnist for Publishers Weekly, the contract that they offered me was $0 and they would take all rights. And I said, I do not work on those terms. Can do you have other arrangements that you're willing to agree to? And we came to a different arrangement. So often you just have to ask. Uh, but again, it helps to have leverage. Uh, if you're going to their door asking for a favor, they may say, well, look, you know, we didn't ask for your work. Uh, these are the terms. So keep in mind the context here. So if, if especially if you're approached um, and you're asked to break your business model, you say, I wish this could work, but these are the sorts of terms or arrangements I typically work on? Do you make arrangements like that? Or I'm again, I'm sorry, but my earnings depend on X. Uh, do you have alternatives? So look at how these are open-ended. I think they're, they're more open-ended questions. They're not confrontational. Uh, I'm not expressing anger. Like, how dare you ask me to write for free? You're garbage. <laughs> I'd never show your face in, in my email box again. Like, I would never do that. Um, but I might be very direct and say, look, I don't, I don't speak for free or I don't write for free. 
can we discuss another arrangement? And so that expresses, if you're interested in, in the arrangement or that other party expresses that you're open, um, that there might be a way to compromise or negotiate something. If you do really wanna shut things down uh, and you don't wanna express openness, maybe you don't like the other party for some reason, you can say, no, I don't do that and you don't leave a door open, you don't crack the window, and the other person is more likely to go away, if that's what you want. Now, money isn't always the most important thing. I think we all know that in life, uh, I hope. There are other factors that go into negotiations, things that might be more important to you, um, how fast you're expected to work, uh, the quality of work you're expected to deliver, um, the relationships that might be in play, who you get to work with, um, the rights involved, how fast the rights revert to you, who keeps certain rights, uh, the reputation of the other party, if it's going to help lift your own reputation, if it's going to build your platform, if there are future deals that might be more lucrative. So there are all of these factors that you can weigh because money, just having the money in your pocket might not actually be the thing that advances your career. It could be something else. It could be an important editorial relationship. Uh, just a brief side note here about conference p &Ls. I've been speaking primarily about written work here. Um, Authors and writers often get asked to speak or teach in some capacity, whether online or in person. And once we get back to in-person events, I, I think everyone should know that those profit and loss statements are really tricky because I've seen them. There are lots of huge costs for hotels um, and it can make it hard for conferences to offer bigger speaking fees depending on you know, what they're charging people to attend. But they may have a lot of wiggle room in other areas, like they may be getting free nights from the hotel. Um, and so they can offer you as a speaker free room nights or maybe meals. Um, so keep that in mind with events that you may need to get creative or innovative if they can't offer you more money. Um, in really difficult situations, you could consider profit sharing agreements where you run a separate class or program or something pre or post workshop, uh, and then you split. Uh, the money that comes in for that separate registration event. So <laughs> there, there are some times uh, when you're working with someone or a company where you really like them, like you want to work with them, but the contract or the deal is just really crappy. And sometimes it's out of that person's control. I mean, I can't tell you how many times working at FNW Media, this mid-sized publisher, I mean, our contract was not that great. I'll just be honest. Um, I mean, it, was, it wasn't substandard in publishing, but it wasn't luring people to our door. And anyone who was working with a big five publisher was very unlikely to leave their big five publisher and come sign with us. We just weren't offering that kind of money. Um, and we also didn't have a lot of marketing support. So, but there are other things you can ask for. There, there were lots of ways to get people on board with less money because they simply liked other qualities about what we did. We did beautiful books. Um, I will pat myself on the back for that. Our books looked great. And I think that there were times when, you know, the authors would sign with this because they knew they were going to get a really great, unusual, unique package that they weren't going to get from their big five who was unwilling to invest that sort of money. So in any event, um, if the money is bad, if the deal is kind of, eh, uh, look, look for things you could be happy about. Suggest what could get you on board. Um, suggest your own solutions. And, and you may be surprised at, at what's possible. A, a brief side note about nonprofits. Uh, so many times when a nonprofit approaches me, now this is usually in reference to events uh, or conferences, they use their nonprofit status as a way to say, well, we can't pay you because we're nonprofit. That's, that is just bogus, okay? <laughs> There's, nonprofits should not be um, neglecting to pay things just because they're a nonprofit. They still pay their rent if they have a building, they still pay their utilities, um, they still pay, they pay for things. You know, If you want things 
in life, you tend to have to pay for them. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't or can't or would never work for a nonprofit at a low or at a low rate or a free rate if you want to support that nonprofit. If it's part of giving back to the community, that's fine. Um, but you know, I just want to say, you know, you're dealing with someone who's not a particularly skilled negotiator if they come to you saying, well, we're a nonprofit, so we expect you uh, to lower your standards on the deal. When you're looking at a contract, you may feel really confused, unsure. Uh, if it's a new partner, um, you just, there may be a lot of doubts and uncertainty. The best advice I could give you in those situations, especially if you're talking about a deal um, on the phone or in some sort of high pressure situation where maybe you're expected to give an answer right away, try to buy yourself some time. It's really terrible to be asked to make a decision right away. And sometimes it's used as a negotiating tactic to get you to agree to a bad deal. So if, you, if you're feeling queasy, something's off, just say, I, I need to check X. I need to check my calendar. I need to check with my husband. I need to check with my business advisor. I need to check with my lawyer. Make something up. Find someone who you need to check with um, to buy yourself some time uh, to consider the deal you've been offered. Anyone who is offering you a, a deal in good faith, they're almost always going to respect that you need time to think about something impor as important as signing uh, signing a, a rights agreement, which is what most publishing contracts are. To gently get out of a bad deal. So this has happened to me on, on a few occasions um, where I was maybe over enthusiastic or not paying attention or rushed for time. And I just said yes. And the contract actually was terrible. And I, it's, it's shame on me uh, for not taking the time and not reading the fine print. There are often still ways to get out of these things, especially if you haven't signed. Um, you, you know, you can say, I'm sorry, I just realized I have I have a rule that I don't like I didn't notice this before. And, you know, sorry, I just I had no idea. Um, or, uh oh, I've got a conflict or I realized I can't fit this in. Uh, try me later. Or again, especially if you haven't agreed to anything yet, you can say, you know, this is really important to me and I want to do my best work, but I've got these other things that are taking priority right now. And I just realized, I, you know, I can't do this and give you my best. And people especially, you know, respect that. They don't want to get the poor quality you. Um, and sometimes it really is about you've got too many things to juggle and also, if you're walking into a deal where you feel bitter or resentful or taken advantage of, you're probably not going to do your best work anyway. So, you know, always, if you have signed the contract, though, look for the termination clause or what happens if one of the parties backs out, because you need to be clear on the consequences should that happen. As I alluded to earlier, there are things that are more important than money just to talk about that a little more. You know, the details that matter, it totally depends on you. It's, it's very personal. Think about the times that you did your best work, what led to that, what, what was the situation. Think about the deals that made you angry because you agreed to them or that led to frustration and failure. Try to avoid those situations in the future. Think about what you need to control uh, to make it good for you or good for your career or good for your future prospects. So as an example, I'll talk about things that matter to me for conference agreements and speaking engagements where often I'm asked to sign a contract and agree to certain things. Um, I have my friends here from Midwest Writers Workshop um, on the slide, Jema uh, and uh, Alan. If I'm asked to speak at a conference, I always ensure I'm not asked to provide paper handouts. It's always digital. I insist on audiovisual equipment in the room. Microphone is mandatory. I have to book the flight and I refuse to take red eye flights. 
my husband and business partner, Mark, should be welcome at that conference within reason. You know, I don't expect the, uh, people to pay like high price dinners or, you know, but he should, you know, he's part of my business. And if he wants to come, he ought to be welcome without me having to pay a registration fee for him. Um, and I won't agree to room sharing. Uh, there's still some conferences that do room sharing for speakers. And that's, uh, I stopped doing that in college. So, you know, everyone has these list of things. Um, you know, some people put in little things just to make uh, the conference feel like, you know, I don't know, like they have, uh, what is it, the green M&Ms thing? Uh, wasn't there some musician who said, uh, in my green room or in my private room, you need to have a bowl of green M&Ms? And, and the point in doing that was to see if they remembered or paid attention to that detail, then you knew that they really read the contract and were paying attention to everything. Um, I don't know what I think about that, but I'm, that's not the sort of thing I'm suggesting here. Um, I'm suggesting more the things that actually, like, it's about you doing a good job. It's not about testing the other party. There are times when you might work for free and it's not a bad thing. Um, you could be supporting something you care about, like the nonprofit situation. There might be networking benefits. It might contribute to your platform. It might help you extend your audience in a new and exciting way. You might learn something. You might improve your own skills. Uh, you might work with people you admire and it could lead to paid work. So let me get a drink of soda here. So let's talk more specifically about what's in book contracts. A well-negotiated contract is gonna protect you when things go bad. So I said at the very beginning of this session that, did I? Uh, I said that, the contract is there for the publisher's sake almost always. It's not there for you. So, you know, the publisher is asserting things that it's going to have rights to, and it's almost always, always in their favor. So if you're, you need to negotiate it so that you are not totally vulnerable, especially if the relationship falls apart. You know, I th in my experience, I, you know, 90, 95% of the contracts I've been involved with things go fine. And you never refer back to that contract. You usually start referring back to it when things go bad and, and you need it there for those times. So as I said, boilerplate contracts protect the publisher and not the author, unless you're working with a really, really super virtuous publisher. Traditional publishing contracts, there are three really important pieces to it from my perspective. It's the, the grant of rights, what rights you're giving to the publisher. And there's usually some sort of like, it's not like a irreversible thing in most cases. There's usually, you know, some packaging around that that defines the limits or the extent of that grant. It's almost never a copyright grant. That would be a work for hire contract. And I'm not really talking about those. There's the issue of payment. So uh, the fees, royalties, advances, bonuses, et cetera. And then very importantly, there's uh, the divorce clause, uh, the, the reversion of rights. So this is when the relationship ends, uh, what governs when and how the relationship ends, what do the parties owe each other when that relationship ends. So those are the three areas that tend to be of primary importance and that you or your agent would be negotiating. And it, there are some uh, certainly other clauses too, but those definitely are, are usually the top priority. So the grant of rights is really, you know, about the beginning of the relationship where you're telling the publisher, okay, or the publisher is saying the, this is how we're going to exploit the work. And I mean that in a neutral way, like they're going to exploit it for both of your benefits for profit. Um, they're going to have certain geographic or territorial rights, rights to certain types of formats. It's going to possibly be for a certain length of time. Uh, for certain languages, and then there might be subrights associated with this. So um, like movie and TV, uh, or theme park, merchandising, these sorts of things. 
Things that in today's book land are rarely negotiable. If you're getting a book publishing contract, that publisher is likely going to assume they're getting print, ebook, and audiobook rights at this point. Um, some publishers might walk away if they're not getting the all three of those. Uh, there might be some rare occasions where you could get away keeping your audiobook less, uh, almost impossible probably now for ebook. If you're a new author, it's your first contract. You haven't, you don't have a track record yet. It's going to be really hard to get approval over the title and cover. You can get consultation, but it's really rare a publisher would hand you approval because that could really jam up the works. Um, similar with formats and pricing, you authors really don't get to tell the publisher what formats and pricing to use. That's under their purview. And then there's a bunch of indemnity legal stuff that you're really not going to get a publisher to change. Things that say like, you know, if you say something really awful in your book and we don't realize you've done something or said something awful in your book, like something illegal, something defamatory, um, you know, it's your problem and not ours. Uh, so there's that sort of language. Um, and, you know, writers are often counseled uh, to get insurance uh, to cover themselves. The truth of the matter is, though, you know, most publishers, if a lawsuit comes against a book they've published or against one of their authors, you know, they're usually in the ring with you and they don't just abandon you. But still, the contract is written in such a way to, to put the burden on you, the author, for ensuring everything is on the up and up as far as the content that you're delivering to them. The payments part of the contract will, uh, the negotiation will mainly be focused on the advance, the size of the advance, the royalty uh, rates. So there's a percentage, like it could be anywhere from like 1% to 25%. Uh, there are escalators, meaning the royalty increases as the book sells more. And then there are the sub rights that I mentioned. And then there's a payment schedule. So you don't get the whole advance up front. It's split into several installments. Um, I just heard recently that some publishers will split it into six installments, which sounds pretty crazy to me, but I guess that's the world we're living in at the moment. Usually the higher the advance, like the like if it's a million dollar advance, it's more likely to be split up into more installments. If it's a small advance, you know, like in the four figures, you're more likely to see that delivered in two to three installments. Here's an example of a royalty escalator. This might be for something like a paperback. Um, this would be, I think, a pretty favorable royalty escalator example. So uh, escalating up to 20% once we get to that 20,000 copy mark. I've seen contracts that don't uh, push up that percentage until they reach 20,000 copies. Uh, but every contract's different. It's, um, but I just show this as an example of what it means that the royalties escalate. The divorce clause, the reversion clause uh, in today's contracts, that's usually triggered uh, when your sales dip below a certain amount. Um, so, you know, fewer than 100 unit sales in a year or uh, less than $100 on your royalty statement. Those are just examples. That's, you know, it's, it's something that you negotiate. You can negotiate higher thresholds that would favor the author, lower thresholds favor the publisher. Uh, if you're interested in exploring rights reversion, there's a really wonderful free guide by the Authors Alliance called Understanding Rights Reversion. You can find that at their site as a free download. Just a brief note about magazine contracts. Uh, you know, in, in the old days before the internet, you know, the most common rights you would be asked for would be first North American serial rights. Uh, these days, you know, contracts may still state something like that, but they're also asking for digital rights in some way, shape, or form. Usually there's exclusivity tied to those print rights for some period. Uh, a weekly magazine will ask for a shorter window of exclusivity than something that's a bi-monthly. Non-exclusivity will often pertain to the digital side of things, so the magazine may take exclusive digital rights for a period of time and then you have non-exclusive rights after that period, like say after a year, and then you both um, are allowed to keep using that material in digital forms. 
There's also reprint and reuse rights. So can the publisher, you know, repurpose, reuse, republish in, in anthologies or turn into different formats, et cetera? Can you do that? And then increasingly uh, magazine articles uh, get optioned for streaming sorts of things or for podcasts. So those rights are becoming more important over time. God is love, but get it in writing, I think is the, is the message here for, for contract negotiations. You don't want to, for something as important as a grant of rights and to anything involving your intellectual property, you want to see those, you want to have an agreement in writing. Um, I have seen emailed contracts governing books and magazine articles, and those can be fine, uh, especially if it's more of a low stakes situation. Um, but for book contracts, you probably want like a really formal, you know, PDF sort of contract that's signed by both people. But the, you know, email contracts also you know, can hold up in court. Uh, but having it in writing is, is, you know, it helps protect you. Um, you don't want to plow ahead based on uh, a phone call or, or text messages. The bad news of everything I have just said for the past 40 minutes is that if you reach a point in your relationship where either of you are referring to the contract as a way of, of managing things, the relationship is likely over. No one wants to be in that situation because it means there's conflict, there, you've become adversarial, um, there's probably disagreement, there's a fight, and now you're going to go to the fine print and see what the contract says and use it as a cudgel. Um, now, this does that, and this may seem to undercut what I just said about get it in writing, but you get it in writing up front so that you all have a clear understanding of what's happening. There's transparency, it's on the record. This is what we've agreed to. This is how we're moving forward. There's hopefully no gray area in the contract. Everyone understands what their responsibilities are, what the terms are, what this relationship is like. And then we move forward. We put the contract aside with that understanding um, and, we, and we work together to create and publish this beautiful thing, we hope. Um, but if you hit trouble, you know, the best way to handle any sort of trouble is not to refer to the contract, but to discuss it and come to some sort of agreement. Um, there are so many times, of course, when authors didn't meet their contracted deadline. And the last thing I would do is say, your contract says, and if you don't do what the contract says, we're going um, to, we're going to make you pay back the advance. You know, I would never do that to an author because I want to maintain the relationship. It's a valuable relationship. And I understand that authors miss deadlines. It happens all the time. So to, to treat it as an adversarial you promised in your contract does not make a bit of sense uh, unless I want to get rid of the author. Um, so just realize if people come to you with, a, with contract language making demands, um, either Either they're not going about things in the most humane way, <laughs> and they're not, you know, very skilled people, uh, people um, handlers. <laughs> I don't. What word do I want there? Um, or they. So either they don't know what they're doing in terms of getting their people motivated, their authors motivated, or they're trying to get rid of you. That's usually one of those two situations. So. Um, this is. I guess. I guess this is a warning. Uh, both as if you negotiate contracts or have to handle contracts, try, try to find a way to move through disagreements uh, without referring to the fine print. The contract will be there if things really do get bad on, a, on like on a, where you have to go to court, you know, and you now the court is going to refer to the contract to see what people are owed and what it says about what people are owed. Uh, no one wants to be in court, so, okay. So that part of the sermon, is now over. Um, I'm going to go to the questions box. I have ignored it so far because I just wanted to get all of my points out of the way first. Um, I have a couple sermons coming up. Uh, one in August is about how I use Notion, which is kind of like Evernote. So it's uh, about how I organize my day-to-day -day life. It's about productivity and management. And then in September, I'm going to be talking about sponsors, advertisers, and affiliates, uh, making money uh, in those ways. Uh, and also my experience with, with those things. So you can sign up for any of those 
uh, at my website. And then there are also paid classes at my website that you can check out. All right, so now I'm gonna to go to the question box and there are usually some really fun questions whenever you talk about contracts and money. So I'm looking forward to this. All right, Tracy says, I have a question that's actually unrelated to the topic of negotiation. Um, and do you take other questions? So Tracy, go ahead and put in your other question. And if we have time, I will answer it. Um, Shamika asks me if I could clarify terms of service. So. Uh, for those who may have joined late, there are contracts that you sign and as like a party engaging with another party. And then there are terms of service, the sort of things that you scroll past when you agree um, to be in a, have an account at Twitter or um, when you have, it's really common in our social media, digital media age, where if you, it's a like software agreements have terms of service, um, social media, most cloud-based services have terms of service that basically say you're agreeing to this when you set up your account and you don't have any power to negotiate it. It is truly a take it or leave it situation. There are a handful of companies in the publishing community that operate like that because you're talking about distributors or retailers and they're not going to negotiate a special deal with every single author that uses their service because it's they're just acting as a distributor. So that includes companies like Amazon, KDP, uh, Ingram Spark, Draft Digital, Smashwords, you know, all these companies have terms of service that you're entering into when you use their platforms to distribute uh, and sell your work. Deborah says, can you recommend any literary lawyers or how to find an experienced one? Yeah, give me just a second. I can do that. I'm going to put this link in the chat. Uh, give me just a second. And I also want to give a shout out to the Authors Guild, which has a contract review service that I highly recommend um, because once you pay a literary lawyer, um, you have probably just paid the membership fee for the Authors Guild. So hold on just a second. I need to find this link. There we go. I'm gonna do a brief screen share just so people know what I'm looking at. Um, Laura Resnick, uh, lauraresnick.com has a really useful set of resources. And one of them, uh, one of the sections of her resource list includes literary lawyers right here. So uh, that's, you can look towards those folks. But again, Authors Guild has a contract review that could be exactly what you need. And I think their membership fee is maybe $150. So check that out as well. Okay. Uh, Christine, I have another question about the terms of service. Christine asks, what's in the terms of service? So this is where things can get scary for folks, maybe unnecessarily so. So like, for instance, in terms of service at Facebook or Twitter or Patreon or any number of places, um, there'll, be, there'll be language in there about how the platform takes rights to your work. Um, but it's almost always non-exclusive rights. And it's almost always related to the ability of that service to actually show the content to anyone in the first place. They're not looking to take your social media posts or your short stories that you posted behind the wall at Patreon and publish them in a book and profit off them and laughing with an evil laugh all the way to the bank as you, you know, <laughs> as you watch in despair at what they've done. Um, if any service did that, their users would flee. Um, there would be a huge uh, public campaign against the company if they did that, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, if, Almost always when there's a new startup of some kind uh, that is engaging with writers or the publishing community, there will be a huge outcry about something in the terms of service that really offends people, something to do with rights. There's something similar, I think, going on with Kindle Vela right now. Um, and then, you know, people use it and it turns out okay. Um, and we all go back to normal life. Um, now, this is not to make light of people's concerns about terms of service and some of the things that can be in there. Um, but I just wanna say broadly, for most people at most times, there's nothing particular to fear about these terms of service. Um, and if there were, you would see 
writers and other creators leaving it, or you would see lots and lots of discussion about what the trade-offs are and whether or not it's worth it. So to give a, a concrete example, if you self-publish your book on Amazon KDP and you enroll in Kindle Unlimited, the terms of service there are that you will not sell your ebook anywhere else, that Amazon has an exclusive on your book. So that exclusive is only for three months, but you are agreeing to those terms when you enroll in Kindle Unlimited or when you enroll in KDP Select. So what happens if you sell your ebook anyway and you go against the terms of service? Well, usually you just get your book kicked out of KDP Select and Kindle Unlimited and then life continues. So, um, or another example would be Amazon's terms of service say, you cannot undercut us on price at other retailers uh, on the ebook. I'm not sure if that applies to the print book. It might apply to print too. So they say it's, it's squirreled away in there that you cannot um, undercut them even at your own website, um, but much less another retailer. So what they do though, if they find you uh, in violation of those terms of service is that they usually price match. So if it's priced at $5 over at Barnes and Noble and it's priced at six at Amazon, they helpfully lower your price to $5. So usually those are the types of outcomes we're talking about, you know, in severe cases, um, if you're really being abusive in some way, like publishing stuff you've been told not to publish, um, they may kick you off the service entirely. Lee asks, how much does an agent typically ass assist with negotiation? That's by definition their job. They are supposed to negotiate that contract. If they don't, um, why do you have an agent <laughs> would be my question. Um, so that, you know, they're the one who is communicating with the editor or the contracts manager, and then they come back to you um, and explain the offer, um, you know, the pros and cons of the offer, uh, and they try to advise you on whether or not you should accept it. It's not their job to accept the offer on your behalf, but they do advise you on whether you ought to sign or if you're likely to get a better deal elsewhere, et cetera, et cetera. Deborah says, other than your book, The Business of Being a Writer, what are some good publications or sites to follow to better understand the publishing industry? Um, as far as books, you might take a look at Before and After the Book Deal uh, by Courtney Mom, which really has a laser focus on that very first book deal if, that, if you're writing and publishing books. Um, Study Hall is a really great resource for freelance writers and journalists because there's just a lot of water, uh, um, water cooler talk. Uh, behind the scenes chatter, gossip network stuff so that you can understand what the good and not so good places are uh, to write for. There's also a great podcast called uh, the Writers Co-op Podcast for freelancers and journalists. They actually cover a lot of the business of freelancing. I think they have a paid class on negotiation skills. Uh, so that's another one to check out if this is a topic that really interests you. Uh, Christine asks, who does the fact checking? Uh, most times that's on the author's shoulders to do the fact checking for their own books. Um, certainly your editor, if they notice things that they know are wrong, they will bring those to your attention. But it's pretty rare for a publisher to hire a fact checker that they would send and they would send your manuscript out to that person because it's so expensive. You know, we're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars. Now there's a lot of discussion about whether this ought to be publisher's responsibility. I'm not gonna comment on that. I'm just gonna say right now it's industry practice not to do it in books. It is common to do it in magazines if you're working for a, a really quality publication like New Yorker, Atlantic, uh, those sorts of places are gonna fact check you and you, you are not responsible for paying for that. Diana says, do most agents do contracts that cover one project at a time, or do they prefer signing one contract that covers all of your work? Um, so that sounds like you're talking about the author agency contract. Um, maybe, well, let me, let me address both situations here. So you may, your agent may ask you to sign a short, it's usually one page agreement that governs your relationship with the agent and the fact that 
you know, you pay them 15% of whatever you earn. And it may say, you know, that any works you produce that, you know, the agent is your representative for those works, et cetera. They're usually pretty non-threatening agreements, but if you're worried about something in an agent author contract, again, go to the author's guild, have them take a look at it. It's really worth the peace of mind to pay that membership fee, just so you know, you're signing an agency agreement that's that standard. Uh, I think SFWA, the Writer Beware site, also has a, a maybe a model agreement uh, between agencies and authors that you could look at. It might be available for free. But the other piece of that question, which might be what you were asking, is do agents prefer to negotiate a single contract with the publisher that governs all your work? That's not really how publishers do book contracts. I mean, yes, there are such, there are two book deals where there might be one contract, there might be eight book deals covered by one contract, but it's normally a book by book contract or it's for two books or it's for three books. Um, and that's because it's just useful, you know, to go, I think, on a book by book contract so you have that opportunity to renegotiate terms. But, you know, your agent's going to advise you, you know, there could be lots of variables here um, that, you know, I, I have, I, I don't see the contract in front of me for the situation, so I can't tell you what to do. Um, have your agent tell you what might be adv advantageous to you in your situation. Uh, I've got a question about my biggest win or biggest regret in terms of negotiation. Um, I did a class with the Great Courses, which is kind of like a publishing company. They're, they're a media company that does classes. It's kind of like masterclass, but more academic or scholarly than masterclass. Um, and so they bring people in, they bring instructors into their studios and they do a studio recording of your entire class. They have a set that they create just for your class. And you're there for like a two solid weeks usually. Um, recording all of these lectures. I had 24 lectures in my class, which is about how to publish a book uh, for traditionally published authors primarily. And so I had to do a lot of work for that. It was, I had to write the script. It was a hundred thousand words, a script that I had to write in three months. Um, and fortunately it's a royalty contract and they work on a royalty agreement that's very similar to a book publishing agreement. My concern, going into that negotiation was that there would be something in there that would prevent me from teaching webinars, that would prevent me from teaching online classes, that could really inhibit my ability to earn a living. This is when I was full-time freelance and I was making, you know, like 30% of my income from teaching. I was very happy to take the money they were going to give me, but uh, it wasn't enough stretched over, you know, the life of that course, which, you know, now it's going into its sixth year of being on sale. It wasn't enough money to cover all my potential earnings from online teaching. So I was very careful to negotiate that to give myself room to not just write on these topics and publish on these topics, but also teach on these topics, um, as long as it wasn't too substantially similar in nature or scope to what I did for them. And so that's worked out fine. It's not been a problem. So I felt kind of anxious because I really wanted to do that course. Um, and I didn't know how far I could push or what sort of language I could get. When I did my research into the company, I was told it was not a very flexible contract. Um, but fortunately we got, we added the, the language I needed in order to make it work. As far as the biggest regret, um, I mean, they're often like the kind of like small, small burning anger regrets at why didn't I think, um, why didn't I think to read that more carefully? Why didn't I tell that person on the phone I needed time to consider it? It's not that the other person acted badly or that um, it's, it's really about I wasn't being vigilant. Uh, in, in asking for what I wanted and just assuming it would be okay. And sometimes it's sometimes, and it's not to say that anyone's been malicious. That's super, super rare that someone would be malicious. It's just really lack of care or people kind of mindlessly taking advantage 
or just following the rules of their organization and doing things that you know don't fit with my style of working. So um, though it's it's for me it's the small things that I regret because that just makes me feel like I didn't value myself highly enough to ask for what I needed. Uh, Elizabeth says, if an author, oh wait, I should go back. Um, so this is going to be an interesting story. This this is. This maybe goes back to relationship management and contracts, where if you have to go back to the contract, um, you know, the, the relationship is broken down or, you know, if, well, let me tell the story. I worked with an author who I just really adored. Uh, we worked together for many years and there was a book that he, uh, he did for us where it actually didn't get to go to market. I'm not gonna get into the crazy story of why, because that would reveal exactly who the author and who the book is, but the book didn't make it to market, period. It, it was just soul crushing. Um, and so later down the line, after some time had passed, he said, well, I'd, I'd really like to get the rights back to that. But the contract, didn't allow for that. It's, it basically said, well, you're going to have to repay the advance or you'll have to do these other things if you want the rights back to the work. Uh, we still, even though the publication was canceled, the, those rights remained with us. And I, I badly, badly, badly wanted to give him those rights back. Um, but my boss wouldn't. She said, you don't just hand someone a sack of sugar. She literally said that. <laughs> you don't hand someone that. And I'm like, but, you know, I, I was just appalled. Um, and unfortunately, there's some people in business that that's how they work. And that really was the end of the relationship. Uh, the fact that I, I wasn't a persuasive enough negotiator with my own boss to show her that this would harm us more in the long run with holding these rights or asking him to pay money for it. Um, those rights were worth nothing to us. Absolutely nothing but we couldn't give away a sack of sugar for nothing. Uh, I just thought that was really regrettable um, as a company, as company behavior, as publisher policy, it was not acting in, I thought in good faith and taking care of our authors. Um, so yeah, that's the sad, the sad story there. Elizabeth says, if an author has to change something after publication, who pays for those costs? Is the author penalized in any way? it would be very rare that the author would be asked to shoulder that. Um, usually, you know, every publisher has a clause in the contract, uh, it has to do with reprints. And, you know, usually it says something like, you know, when we're getting close to a reprint, uh, where you have to, you know, print more copies, or you upload a new edition, the ebook edition, whatever it happens to be, we're going to contact you and give you a chance to tell us what we missed, you know, what are the errors? Or do you have, or has the situation changed? Like in nonfiction, you may need to, you know, change some facts uh, that are no longer true. Um, and then of course, in the case of fiction, there are times where you need to make a change for some reason or another. So yeah, the publisher will, as a matter of business, they expect to make those updates and it, it would have to be a really bizarre situation for the author to be charged. It just doesn't happen that way. Uh, there would have to be some serious negligence and I, I, even then uh, negligence on the part of the author and even then I can't imagine a publisher charging for that unless it's like I don't know a super small press or maybe one of these scholarly presses or um, I think we might have had something in the contract that said we would charge authors 10 or 25 dollars for a correction if it was beyond a certain amount because we didn't want people to go crazy with the corrections. Um, so there might be those sorts of rarities, but by and large, no, you're not gonna be penalized. All right, well, I've had so much fun talking about this that we're now uh, past four o'clock. So I'm gonna wrap it up there. Thank you all for coming and thank you for your questions. I'm sorry that I couldn't get to them all, um, but this is a very rich topic and I'm sure that I'm going to be revisiting this again. Uh, if you missed the entire presentation or a portion of it, you're just tuning in now, uh, it's going to be posted on my YouTube channel. So that's youtube.com slash Jane Friedman. So thank you very much for coming and I hope to see you again. Bye-bye. <laughs>